Please, a warm welcome to Ben Jeans Houton. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, the, I'm much more comfortable just speaking without notes, um, but it's a complex subject, so I've written it all out. So bear with me in that it might be a little bit boring and then I'm just reading off something. Um, but I'm going to take you through loads of stuff and hopefully you'll find interest in and amongst it. Um, and I'm more than happy to chat about any of it at the end. Um, but it's quite a stint of information, but I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Through my intuitive exploration and generative experimentation as an artist and researcher, I present today an opportunity to entertain a tangential, ecosystemic, and existential exploration of astrology from the metaphysical perspectives of Gnostic philosophies. This presentation is an introduction to an exploration of the relationships between Gnosticism, astrology, animism, and AI with reference to the speculative worlding evident in the histories of film and animation. I will propose their function as the prophetic warnings of our collective subconscious that dramatize the outcomes of our exponential trajectory towards apocalypse. In the first half, I will propose a developmental, non-denominational chronology that maps the evolution of a living cosmos, exploring how its essential structures may echo into incarnation and the architecture of a Gnostic astrology, with reference to both pessimistic and optimistic perspectives. I will continue to speculate on the existence of three states of being, whereby our erotic immersion in the theater of incarnation provides us with transformative opportunities for materiality, spirituality, and magic. I will continue by illustrating a Mobius loop in space-time, centered on the solar wound of atomic warfare that echoes back into Gnostic histories and forward into artificially intelligent futures, establishing a foundation from which to speculate on the macrocosmic and microcosmic function of the nuclear wound as an evolutionary initiation within the architecture of a Gnostic astrology. In the second half, I will then deepen these perspectives by way of reference to the history of cinema, providing examples that look back to the origins of our understandings and forward to our worlding of futures yet to arrive, in hopes of illuminating the dreamlike function of a living cosmos, ever called into being by the eros of incarnation. The astrotheology of Mika Dank and others makes a strong argument that the Gnostic current that mutated with the help of Roman politics into the Christianity we largely encounter today is in large part an astrology with amnesia, Jesus being the sun and his disciples being the zodiac. Stephen Skinner's Magician's Tables gives us ample opportunity to think with deities or archons or planets in a variety of histories in correspondence with their planetary analogues that preceded their various guises when dressed in the colors and cultures of each embodied geography that remembers them. Today it is my hope to explore Gnostic discourse towards its fundamental premises and reconsider astrology from these perspectives. It is this thread I feel qualified to pull on due to my immersion in a world of ideas that have dressed themselves in the primacy of images. Being a visual artist and filmmaker, I have an ability to be with and work through imagery to discern tangents and patterns that may otherwise be unobvious when typically outshined by the solar theater of the narratives that carry their flames onwards from the hearts of authors to the hearths of audiences. It strikes me that at the heart of the radical dualism of Gnostic dialogues, there are three twinned key themes, those being duality or dialogue, entrapment or embodiment, and illusion or dreaming. Later in this talk, I will map the seed of these themes through a chronology of films and television series. I do this because I feel that cinema and television's moving images have always been an extension of our dreaming, voicing the utopian and the, dy and the dystopic as seeds and warnings. There are a variety of Gnosticisms, and each has its own cosmogenesis. In the hopes of exploring a non-denominational Gnostic astrology, here is a brief storyboard to set the scene of our inquiry. Before the universe began, there was everything and nothing, a gray pool, edgeless and asleep. Then a faceless question arose, disturbed the waters, and asked, who am I? 
The all awakened and its ripples birthed the dialogue of difference as it began to forget its wholeness in the pulsing shadows cast by its queries doubt. The search for the answer began to pull definition towards the question as it stirred the pool from gray to white forming a black stone in its center from which to define itself. Once the ultimate definition was formed, much to the all's surprise, the answer still eluded it. If the question could not be answered from one finite perspective, perhaps it best be sought everywhere in the infinite multiplicity of the myriad. In an inspired instant, the white pool and black stone inverted, becoming a black pool and a white orb, which promptly exploded, creating the many suns, local gods whose distant starlight still adorn the long night of the all's cosmic search for self. Each sun, a raging fragment of celestial consciousness, cast apart and ablaze in space's dark waters, searching like a torch through the body of its ignorance for the ultimate answer to unify the all. Each an individual opportunity to approach, experience, and answer something of the original question from a different personified perspective. In time, our sun externalized aspects of itself, populating the drama of its soul by building mirrors in its image from the debris of its chaotic birth, in which to reflect upon the question. Great and vast lessons were learned and archetypal agencies formed within the cosmic violence of deep time. These mirrors, the planets, deities born of our sun's exploration of the prismatic personhood that populates it whole, would later stir the seas to prompt life's cameo. Each planet dressed accordingly with the faces that colored the spectrum of cultures as their spiral dance played out the mythic theater of the solar giant's boundless existential inner opera. Once the theater was built, stage set, and cast assembled, the solar system became a cosmic clock capable of calibrating consciousness into the myriad. Lithe tendrils of energy called souls hurtled screaming from the sun and plunged into matter weaving themselves like needles in and out of the fabric of the material world, accruing experiences through the ancestral tapestry of their incarnations, adding fibrous fidelity to the, to the choral search for remembrance of the wholeness once known. In the earliest ages to acclimatize to the dense torsion and violent stroboscopic metamorphosis of their newly storied selves, the souls slept first in the rocks for millennia, made strong, forged in magma through the infernal crucible of fractious nightmares, awakening freed, unified, and imperishable as crystal dreams. From there they moved into the primordial seas until one fateful cellular dawn, biology kissed itself into being, divided, moved, fed, and bred, replicating the procreative dynamic division of the universe's inception. From worms to fish, reptiles, mammals, monkeys, and humans, billions of lessons were learned and indelibly integrated back into the all with each life lived. Growth was etched into the souls with a legacy that would outlive the iterant pulse of life's births, selves, and deaths. Stories written in words that transform the essence beyond our atoms that cannot be forgotten nor need a self to remember. The planets and the stars continued to ghostwrite the dramatic symphony of each soul's becoming from the sidelines behind the blue curtain of our world. Consciousness explored itself through a billion eyes, mouths, hands, minds, and hearts through chorus and quarrel alike. What we see here is a description of imminent layers of immersion that offer the experience of difference and the dialogue afforded by it, that in turn generate meanings that transcend it. In contemplating these layers and selves, we swiftly encounter the conundrum of consent, which may lead us quickly to a pessimism or an optimism dependent on our perspective, which we will go on to investigate more later. If we consider each star as a local sun, itself a god amongst an ecosystem of other gods, we could propose that beyond the local experience of each god and their creation of planetary deities and immersion into matter amongst the theater of their souls, we can at once imagine that the quintessence of each sun, each local god, is playing myriad roles in the terrestrial theater of distant solar systems touched by its light. It may prove illuminating to consider light as a search for remembrance and the catalytic embodiment of this light with matter as a remembering of a wholeness once known. 
perhaps the light of distant stars, in themselves local gods having terrestrial experiences, are affecting something of their accrued enlightenment on distant worlds. An idea I hope to speculatively explore more in future is the universe being akin to a neural net of vast synaptic activity and that each local god may at some time evolve a soul capable of embodying its potential and that this soul remains to inspire others towards this same evolutionary enlightened terrestriality. In this case, we could imagine Buddha as an incarnation of the first cell in a larger local body to embody a transcendental immanence, and that perhaps every other soul is in fact the local incarnation of a distant sun, that the whole universe is an integrative ecosystem that transforms through the psychedelia of embodied theater towards the remembrance of a wholeness once known. Perhaps each of us is literally an earthly avatar of a distant star, a mutable bead whose shining face reflects a distant god who briefly explores and expresses the terrestriality of a quantum holographic event in the nodal weft and weave of Indra's net. To dramatically paraphrase a story, a journalist once commented on a Tibetan Rinpoche's generosity of time towards a gaggle of children who followed him around, to which his assistant corrected him, stating that these were all of his recently deceased friends. In Tibetan Buddhism, a trinity of astrologers work together to calculate the most likely event in space-time that will create the conditions for the reincarnation of a recently deceased Rinpoche, Lama, or Buddha. They are often accurate to a mile radius and a week of time. On arriving in the area, they show three objects to the newborns and await their previous owner's atavistic urge to reclaim their stuff. If this reality seems familiar, you may have heard of the three wise men who follow a star to Bethlehem to find the Son of God, a Buddha born into a new cultural geography with hopes of embodying enlightenment that it may catch like a wildfire that sings another slice of us home. Gnosticism has an his a historical reality and is sometimes dismissed as a proto-Christianity, but the core preoccupations and intimations of Gnostic philosophies have been prevalent for as long as there have been thoughts and in a whole host of cultures. Generally, there are two main forms of Gnosticism, philosophically, pessimism and optimism. A Gnostic pessimism proposes we are trapped in matter within the perverse mind of a false god, either due to an anomaly or as the punitive outcome of ancient errors. From this perspective, the Old Testament god is in fact a demiurge who is playing a manipulative, neoliberal, divide and conquer long game to egg us into the divisionary obliteration of our humanity via an, via an organic matricide that will ensure our apocalyptic demise so that it doesn't have anything to compare itself to that could make it seem less by existing. We could see this as the teenage tantrum of our local sun at a critical point in its psychic evolution, where it rejects the macrocosmic galactic family and awkwardly attempts to break out on its own, its fledgling individuality a pressure cooker of the complexity it rejects, framing us as a dislocated part of it that it seeks to punish through dissociative acts of self-harm. Some, summed up, we could see this as a dislocated mind that attacks the body as the abusive autoimmune auto mythopoeia of mind-body dualism. From a Gnostic pessimist's perspective, Adam and Eve existed in the climaxed organic equilibrium of Mother Earth when God turned up with a God complex and laid claim to all creation, demanding respect, adoration, and compliance because this place, their lives, and his love were all contingent on them never eating from the tree of knowledge through which they would themselves be as he is and know the differences between good and evil. Again, here we have an opportunity to observe the potential tyranny of a local sun holding all of its celestial kin's terrestrial avatars hostage to populate the theater of its egocentric denial of radical collectivity. The serpent here considered as symbolic of the ever-ascending transformational nature of divine energy then encouraged them to know, to eat of the entheogenic fruits of their mother's sophianic love so that they may realize, in an embodied sense, a gnosis that would liberate them from the overlaid mentation of a patriarchal prison they had been taught to fear, revere, and adore, that in fact sought to separate them from the organic truth of their maternal home and their inherent cosmic divinity to ensure their demise. 
We may also make the cos cosmobiological analogy here to a cancer cell that conscripts others into an exponential denial of its own mortality, a monoing of the many. Here, however, there is the possibility for a more optimistic perspective in that the Eden of our world may be an organic, immersive simulation created by our local God in which it may elect to forget its nature, to awaken after the difficult dream of life with an insight impossible from without, itself so invested in its own immersion it becomes its own jailer, who for a time resents the very thing it died to dream, a lucid enlightenment. Gnostic pessimism has long been a preoccupation of sci-fi and fantasy's speculative existentialism and is at the core of much of the threat of extinction being exponentially automated by the development of AI. The pessimists feel that we are trapped inside the machinations of a karma, ghost-written by the planetary forces understood to be controlling archons, who as henchmen of a false god orchestrate the bureaucracy of our suffering, whilst we are asleep in an illusory world that we do not belong in and that we must escape. A Gnostic optimism, I'm a Gnostic optimist, uh, tends to feel that we are the filamentary, sensate surface area of a branching lineage of differentiated personhood, first seeded in the birth of the universe, considering people to be akin to leaves at the tips of the branches of a vast living ecosystem, whose differentiated immersion in various strata of being allow for a psychedelic theater of change in which we play myriad iterant parts as we continually incarnate through a dialogical dance of difference towards the mutual enlightenment of all beings. The optimists feel that our souls virtuously and deliberately elect to be woven into the living dream of a life, to learn things impossible from without, and that solar systems are cosmic clocks that calibrate novel opportunities for consciousness to be etched into organic life. To undergo immersive tutelary transformations through the theater of the real. Let us imagine for a moment that a soul is akin to a person made of light who voluntarily walks into a library every day, that they sit down and a book is placed before them. The book has a name on its spine, your name, a face on its cover, and a synopsis on the back that gives the summation of the story without giving away the ending. The soul voluntarily opens the book and begins to read, and the poetry of this first unutterable sentence is so profound that they are born into a life so compelling it will be the entirety of their everything until one day they die to it and awaken to the ripened totality of its meaning. As a Gnostic optimist, I feel that my soul consented to undergo the experience of my life and myriad others, but I do not consider myself to be an, an organic suit being ridden for sport by some distant party, but rather that I am a symbiotic avatar alive within a generative ecosystem of great meaning that transcends my eminence and its small self. I, as a person, consent to my existence, despite the fact I, as a person, did not consent to be born. This consent is the radical freedom granted by a Gnostic optimism. Thank you. Also, thank all of you for turning up, not just here, but in life, because it's rough. <laughs> um, okay. Within Gnostic pessimism, the fall of divinity into matter has largely been interpreted as a negative, that divine light fell through folly and became trapped in matter. Here, however, as a Gnostic optimist, I will propose that light is a quintessential catalyst towards enlightenment through a dance of mutual metamorphosis with matter. This is not to say that light is in itself enlightened, but is the raging search of a quintessential question energetically expressing an existentialism. This is also not to say that void and matter are two forms of absence and ignorance, but rather necessary space and fertile material through which an enlight enlightenment can be embodied. One of the key propositions of this talk is that light is a catalytic process that awakens worlds, whose life provides the universe with a psychedelic opportunity to world its shadow towards the remembrance of a unity once known. A possibility from this perspective is that a sun, as part of its evolutionary cycle, projects aspects of itself into the matter that aggregates into planets through which its solar theater enriches or enlivens that matter, whilst offering it a reflective theater to expand the fidelity of its psychic faculties. 
In this scenario, the emergence of life could be understood to be a psychedelic event horizon through whose metamorphic membrane a vast interconnected theater of change is worlded. In our consideration of this, we could propose that perhaps the primordial psyche of the planets are in fact becoming themselves by way of communal encounter with a terrestrial plant medicine of which we are the theatric theatrically ambulant mammalian agents. After which they will be whole enough to fundamentally transcend the physicality of their separation and become reintegrated aspects of self in the totality of our local God, the sun. A process of ripening finalized by the sun expanding into a red giant and incorporating the awakened matter into the orb of its own enlightenment before the final integration offered by a wandering black hole. If we consider the quintessentially, quintessentially theatrical nature of the zodiac, planets, luminaries, and asteroids, we are granted an opportunity to perceive the narrative mechanics of our experience through both a Gnostic pessimism and an optimism. The Gnostic pessimist need look no further from the manipulative machinations of a diabolically deterministic architecture ruled over by an abusive god and his archons than the actuality of astrology itself. The Gnostic optimist, too, need look no further for the beatific complexity of a star turbine that teaches energy through embodied experience, danced by deities towards the virtuous and mutual enlightenment of all beings. Both this pessimism and optimism fall under a pers per perspectivism, with the, el the elasticity to accept the innate differentiation inherent in everything. Either way you take it, there is a solid argument that a solar system is, in its most fundamental terms, a theater of change, where transformation is worlded through embodiment. At this stage, it may be useful to consider a tiered architecture of this theater, which supports a variety of layers of immersion, which we can again consider from both a Gnostic pessimism and an optimism. Some of the Gnostic pessimists had a hierarchical conception of the incarnate, in that they believed there were three types of people. The pneumatics were spiritual beings who embodied gnosis, a lucid communion with the all. Uh, the psychics, which were an intermediary stage of awakening unto the possibilities of gnosis, and the hylix, who were trapped in their lower natures, asleep in the dream of a false god, and were currently beyond saving until they had been cleaned through the pain of suffering, the consequences of their ignorance. To expand upon this, it's heavy stuff, some of it, but hopefully it's kind of light at the end of the tunnel very possibly. Um, to, to expand upon this premise and explore these ideas in a Gnostic optimism, we can examine other ways of thinking with these tiered realities and their various agencies. It may be helpful for us to consider that there are three main states of being. Um, we pulse in and out of these things all the time, in seconds, minutes, days, years. Despite these various factors, all three states are holy, and by virtue of existing, equally important generators of every color of meaning. Firstly, the state of the unconscious or materiality in which we are asleep in the dream of life, being invisibly danced by the universe and largely under the influence of the sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Arguably in our world, this is where the majority of people exist currently, fully immersed in the theater of their lives, dutifully transforming through the cosmic choreography that was etched into them at the moment of their birth. From the unconscious position, things just happen through dramatic presence. Much of the unconscious life is lived with a feeling of total immersion. Things are felt deeply, change takes root, and structures are readily built that have a sense of autonomy and fidelity. There can be a propensity towards getting stuck in habitual loops. Lessons are experienced with such gravity that, the fe that they feel relevant in a fixed sense, rather than as metamorphic chapters in a series of new lessons. So personal stagnation can occur. Secondly, the state of the subconscious or spirituality in which we wake up inside the dream of life and begin realizing we are being invisibly danced by the universe and begin to contemplate the influence of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The bandwidth and terrain of experience starts to broaden, seeding existential curiosities that lead towards a search for a metaphysics that can accommodate and express the world beyond the material.
Patterns begin to be understood in, sorry, noticed in unconsciously learned behaviors whose roots are chased back to formative events, environments, and encounters. Astrology and other spiritual sciences become a clear tool for personal exegesis. The transformative cycles of magical reality begin to be understood, the sense of self becomes ecosystemic, and the proximity of personhood becomes an event rather than an object. Thirdly, the state of the conscious or magic in which we become lucid in the dream of life, working through our cosmic choreography and dancing the universe into being by connecting with Pluto, unlocking Chiron and aligning with our nodal axis through a quantum co-creation and consenting collaboration, in turn enabling the macrocosmic meaning etched into being through our microcosmic embodiment to bloom towards a gnosis. Please forgive the problematic simplification of this next speculation, but it feels useful to think with as a dynamic mechanism of a larger cosmobiology. Something we could consider is that worlds provide a theatrical stage through which distant light is atmospherically personified as terrestrial ambassadors of celestial energy or angels whose light then casts a shadow, or demons, when it touches matter, and that this point in space-time between the two creates events or persons who embody change and etch it into dynamic energy as a dyadic agent of synthetic awakening. In this sense, questing light touches the surface of planets and planetary bodies and awakens their energetic matter in the form of primal powers and principalities that begin to evolve through a multiplicity of personified embodiments held in tension through the dialogue created in between these two dyadic aspects of difference, awakening the raw matter of worlds through the psychedelia of personhood. In this sense, we could consider light as terraforming the matter of worlds, awakening it unto itself and being mutually enlightened in the process, leading us to consider points of contact as persons, themselves events in space-time. After all, biblically accurate angels are often de depicted as therianthropic avatars whose four faces of a bull, lion, eagle, and man represent the fixed signs of Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius, the eagle being the evolved symbol of Scorpio before it phoenixes into the spiritual quest of Sagittarius. Else they are depicted as flaming wheels of eyes, the microcosmic personified figurations of macrocosmic solar systems, star turbines whose metamorphic machinations make meaning. From here, we could also consider Jesus' crucif crucifixion as an analogy of incarnation, to be martyred as an avatar of the all towards the enlightenment of all beings on the wheel of change, the axis of a solar system's zodiac embodies, and to return resurrected to attest to the metaphysical metempsychosis of reincarnation. People often level a criticism at astrology that it is the byproduct of a misplaced anthropomorphism and a spurious supposition of superstitious symbolism to the psychological traits of what it is to be a human. But they neglect to consider that a living cosmos worlds the many colors of itself through stars and planets and the dance of their particularities that stirs evolution and everything it generates into animate being. The constellation of Taurus is not just like a bull, it wove from our world the very avatar of its being. Constellations are terrestrial events. Like iridescence, they exist in the space between object and subject. Taurus only looks like Taurus from our address. And likely, its stars form a myriad of appendages of various mythic beings from the local vantage point of alien worlds. Our sun, too, may well be an archetypal aspect of agency that is ghostwriting the karmic drama of Alpha Centauri and a million others. There is not one being that is not a dance between distant light woven through Eros from the matter of our darkness. All things are avatars, avatars of the all. Everything is sex. Every star that touches our world in a kinship of constellation with its distant kin is weaving into being another avatar of its origins. Terrestriality is constellated, enfleshed, embodied. You, me, and everything we have ever perceived are the love children of glittering alien influence. The scorpion is over 420 million years old, developing its body in the primordial seas before breaching land and heading for the desert, where it remains. 
From one extreme to the other, eros is a gravity that moves us, impels our communion with difference, that we may further explore and express another color of the all. The scorpion has long been a symbol of transformation for great reason. I propose that worlds provide a psychedelic event horizon upon whose marbled membrane of material metamorphosis, distant starlight becomes embodied through a terrestrial theater of maturation that transforms the seemingly disparate realities of light and density to awaken in each other a mutuality capable of more, so a healthy relationship. In this sense, humans may too be macrobiotic and theogenic avatars for the fractious enrichment of planetary forms, themselves the prismatic prismatic faculties of suns as local gods, as brief and brilliant as the bubbles we momentarily adore. To paraphrase Taoist sage Master Shuang's musing on the nature of the real, he famously stated that he once dreamt that he was a butterfly, completely unaware of the reality of his person, and upon waking from the dream was unsure if he was, in fact, now a butterfly dreaming of being a person. He also stated that during our dreams, we do not know we are dreaming. We may even dream of interpreting a dream. Only on waking do we know it was a dream. Only after the great awakening will we realize that this is the great dream. This perspective is explicitly expressed in many of the films explored through this presentation. He also went on to say, we come to enjoy ourselves in it, come what may, and in so doing we add meaning of our own, proving ourselves to be life's creative participants. We discern and live, thereby enhancing life. We change life by making life coherent. And we are, in the meantime, changed by living the, co the coherence we continually create. If we are to take the ubiquitous experience whereby we do not realize we are dreaming as meaningful, some light may be cast upon these mirrored notions. It seems for a dream to do its job, it's important that we are dreaming. In our immersion in the dream and ignorance of a world beyond it, the dream maintains a kind of symbolic economy, whereby we are deeply moved and changed by its scenarios. Something is learned, transforming us on a very deep level that invisibly unfolds to affect our waking lives. In the moments when we wake up inside our dreams, this subconscious pedagogy ceases to be effective and something new takes place as we find ourselves lucid gods in a garden of our making. If it is important we do not realize we are dreaming for dreams to do their job, the same might be said for our lives. If living is a story, energy is undergoing to affect change, then bar our enlightenment, it appears best that we often f uh, that we are often fully immersed in the totality of our experience, so that what must happen does. At this point, we will now dive into a chronology of events, historic, cinematic, and animatic, that will further express the speculativity of these notions. To set the scene for an interpretation and explanation of what Gnosticism may be, and to chart a course for its relevance now in relationship to the living cosmos of an astrology, we need to travel back to Egypt to the year 1945 when a farmer in Nag Hammadi unearthed clay pots containing vellum-bound codices buried for several thousand years. Within these texts were original copies of the Gospels that had become the basis for the Bible, alongside other Gospels, scriptures, and philosophical texts that were considered apocryphal, that directly contradicted the top-down patriarchal pyramid erected in the face of the fear of the feminine, deliberately omitted from the formative homogenesis of the Christianity most extant today, arguably proliferated in part to install the self-governing -govern moral malware of a monotheism in a polytheistic and pagan populace whose animism was insubordinate to the mentate centrism of governance. These discoveries, pulsing ramifications, have been catching up with history ever since and rewriting the censorship of many institutions that have long dominated the historical narrative. There once existed a pre-enlightenment period of alchemical inquiry where Renaissance individuals ran creative experiments as they began to understand that material transformation also enacted energetic metamorphosis, that ritual theater amplified spiritual evolution, and that the world was a mirrored dream towards an awakening. However, as this knowledge increased, so did the edges of their specificities and eventual binary dislocation. 
Spirituality went one way and science another. In the shadow of science's questions, spirituality chased its poetry into a literalism that gave them impunity to kill in the totalizing name of one God's holy war, while science chased its atheism to the solar furnace of the atom, and in the absence of spirituality's gnosis, immediately enacted the maximal dislocation of atomic warfare. It is no coincidence that the Nag Hammadi texts were unearthed in the same year we actuated their prophetic conclusions by dropping an atomic bomb on ourselves. It is synchronicity that, like sonar, reveals the shape of hidden truths. Central to this presentation is a speculative premise that the, de that the detonation of atomic bombs are all co-present aspects in the geography of space-time that form a rupture in the fundamental body of our reality and that this phenom phenomena is the initiatory nuclear wound of our local solar system, echoed in the Chironic wound that each of us carries one chapter of in our own embodiment. If you look up Chiron in your chart, it will show you the thing that would take five or six years of psychoanalysis to put your finger on. Um, but, but it's good to do it with an astrologer because they can like ease you into it. Um, and also, psychoanalysis is wonderful. Whatever you choose is the right thing as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Um, I propose here that this wound in space-time echoed backwards into the past of Gnostic scripture and rippled forwards into an imminent AI singularity that is yet to ripen but is on the boil. The various Gnostic cosmogenesis we have inherited since the discoveries in Nag Hammadi have until now been read with an air of literalism as retrospective cosmogenic accounts of the origins of the universe, and understandably so. But the older I get, the more co-present and quantum almost all things become. And in the binary brutality of atomic warfare and the looming threat of an AI singularity, I can't help but wonder if many scriptures that attest to our origination and entrapment within the mind body of a false god were not also warnings that alluded to our unfortunate ends prophetically called into being by them if we fail to heed the passions of their perspectives. It is my contention that much of the radical dualism of early Gnosticisms were the prescient embodiment of a modern problem, that being the dislocated actuation of mind-body dualism through the externality of our techni themselves the egregoric machinations of an, of an overinflated and exhausted addiction to mind. If we are not careful, we are going to embody the machinations of our shadows, and that will be bitter medicine indeed, that we may not last nor deserve to, for they may well be the calculative crescendo of all of our unchecked cruelties. As I speculated previously, if we consider the jealous, wrathful deity of the Old Testament whose insecurity demands adoration, we may observe a stage of development as opposed to a totalizing definition of a deity. Perhaps our local sun has been working itself out and self-harming as it learns to liberate itself from its own ego by at points suffering under it and the consequences of that through us. In that vein, the atomic bomb is the chironic, self-inflicted wound of which an ego oscillates around, whilst being immersed in the metamorphic myth mythology of an individual experience, trapped in a binary black-on-white essay as yet unable to get to the prismatic point. One less linear way we could think about time is to imagine that events have an apex of meaning that waxes and wanes, and whose totality we traverse as it ripens and rots. From this perspective, future events are often calling, uh, calling to us as they ripple back through time into our yesterdays, whilst also seeding futures in the possibility of our tomorrows. From the perspective of a materialism in the causal chronology of time, we enact magic to create futures. But from an atemporal perspective where everything that was, is, and will be are in eternity, magic could be seen as our prescient ritual capacity to throw surprise parties for futures that exist but are yet to arrive. Perhaps successful magic... <laughs> Thank you. I like deeply, like all my atoms, deeply appreciate that. That was really lovely. Um, perhaps successful magic is a praxis of animated prophecy that faithfully predicts because it's touching a future. 
Um, whilst imagining that this nuclear wound sent ripples through the fabric of space-time, warning ancient pasts of the perils of dawning futures, we will now consider a chronology of cinematic and animatic histories that world aspects of these ideas in relationship to a Gnostic astrology. I do feel that moving images are an expression of our collective dreaming, and that dreams are theatres of awakening. Um, I'm going to start talking like uncomfortably fast to make sure that I get through all this. So, so sorry. Um, the following list is by no means an exhaustive summation of the Gnostic themes that underpin a great deal of cinematic and animatic history, but has been selected to illustrate their key embodiments in our collective dreaming. A decade after the post-nuclear trauma of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese psyche birthed the primal power and atomic animism of Godzilla, the wrathful deity itself a byproduct of nuclear fallout, personifying a reckoning with our propensity towards apocalypse. This inaugural example sees a nerve that runs through the backbone of this presentation, that being our species' propensity towards externalizing our psychic faculties via welding various strata of our collective consciousness through the silver screen, which I argue are an extension of our astrological capacity for self-reflection, that channels our Gnostic impulses to map the cages we find ourselves in, that we may build, build ladders from their bars by which to transcend mazes of entrapment. The pessimist's false god and its prison planet may well be us, and our dislocated allegiance to mind over all else and the apocalyptic consequences of our incarceration in its illness. One of the great positives of this cinematic capacity is the opportunity for lucid self-reflection. One of the great negatives is the propensity towards becoming habituated to its warning nightmares, to the point they become dramatic entertainment and cease to inspire us, inspire us with the radical possibilities and indeed the fundamental need for change. By 1966, the need to examine the atomic wound had landed in the poetic psyche of French director Chris Marker, with the pantemporal salve being the exploration of an emotional time machine whereby a post-nuclear survivor, so tied to a moment of peak emotion in his past, was able to bilocate his consciousness to the time before apocalypse to glean details that could lead to either its avoidance or remediation. Here we see a psychogeography of emotional historicism, an apex event becoming a doorway through which the holographic past, ever within us, may be re-navigated towards revelation, much as we can through dream work or ritual. The poetry of this Mobius fatalism would take another three decades to percolate into the silver-screened subconscious of the West in American director Terry Gilliam's remake, 12 Monkeys, which we'll talk about later. Um, by 1968, the macrocosmic operatic arc of our microcosmic struggle with mind-body dualism was given its first airing, arguably one of the most prescient and important expositions of this presentation's core ideas. I would argue that there is a meaning behind the occulted nature of astrological insights in that they offer profound opportunities to step beyond our immersion in the theater of our transformations that may in many ways be a hindrance to a process that relies on our ignorance of it to dance through us with an energetic economy. Perhaps everything is always unfolding at the pace of an awkward perfection so that the fruit of all follies seed gardens yet to come. Perhaps it is important that most people dismiss astrology and the agency it affords us because they are faithfully enacting a necessary dreaming into being of the whole. Perhaps in the dyadic dance of difference, for one to be awake, another must be asleep, and holy are those dreamers because their faith is total. By 1972, Solaris gave us an opportunity to encounter the animistic immune response of a sentient planet who's, who forces the human astronauts through a hallucinatory catharsis of their own unresolved traumas to protect itself from their capacity to infect worlds with their shadows. A year later, in 1973, the mortal theater of man and machine was dramatized in Westworld, which offered us self-reflexive opportunities to reconsider our own humanity and how much of it our mechanical kin would inherit. In a theme park populated by the subservient robots, hosting the guests' entertaining immersion into a wild western unreality, our attention was brought to our own archontic propensity to trap ourselves and others in prisons of our making. The film questioned how free we were beyond those deep designs that urge us into comp compulsive expression. Here we see the beginning of our wrangling with transhuman ideas of a coded destiny and its fatalism through a hypertheater where avatars labor under the machinations of a false god, in this case, Westworld's creator. I would again argue that this film is at its core a welding of an astrological existentialism automated through the machinations of a Gnostic pessimism that again relies on the 
uh, on that reality's illegible totality to work. Sometimes abstraction is necessary to get past our habitual dismissals to deliver its point, which is why dreams are weird. Um, in 1973, Gene Roddenberry, the creator of uh, the TV series Star Trek, met Gene Dolgoff, who owned a holography laboratory in New York City. This meeting inspired the creation of the fictional holodeck in which virtual realities were generated so that the characters could work through simulated physical, philosophical, and anthropological dilemmas without real-world consequence, but things often went awry. Within the animated series in the 1974 episode Practical Joker, hollow novelists who provide scenarios and stories for use on the holodeck develop a pathological addiction to the holodeck, a condition known as hollow addiction. Here, Star Trek dramatizes the opportunities and problems created by building a virtual world as much or even more compelling than the physical world in which it exists. Which in, where incessant optionality fuels the perilously en endless trajectory of desire. It's kind of like Instagram. Where the erotic gravity of embodiment weaves us through dreams within dreams within dreams. In 1979, Stalker walked us through the perilous psychic portent of a post-cataclysmic landscape whose insubordinate ontologies offered opportunities for profound poetic self-reflexivity. Um, this is such an important film. Please do watch it if you haven't. In which its visitors would either perish or be utterly transformed. By 1979, Alien branded the minds of the world who for the first time came face to face with the scorpionic avatar of the plutonic shadow, a being from the edge of our universe who was born from within us, forcing us to face the as yet irrepressible violence of our own haunted humanity, which anyone who's got Scorpio placements knows all about. Hans Rudi Giger's preternatural ability to world the shadow haunted the cinematic lucidity of Scott's uh, film. Geiger was himself, Giger, sorry, was himself an avid explorer of astrology, explicitly evidenced in his zodiac fountain, and was arguably one of the first to explore the biomechanical machinations of a star turbine built in essence to whirl the shadow, integrate its power, and liberate the darkness via a lucid, embodied illumination of direct mystical experience or gnosis. Here we could argue further that gnosis is the evolutionary outcome of an astrological embodiment. By 1984, Pluto moved into Scorpio in the transhuman parable first expressed by paranoid saint Philip Kindred Dick in his novel The Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, was voiced through the moving images of Blade Runner, providing another opportunity to begin to contemplate our own place within the conundrum of determinism, fatalism, and free will. The demiurgic figure of the bioengineer Tyrell gives us an opportunity to consider the chironic wound that may be one of the core metaphysical machinations of an immersive incarnation in its evolution function within a living cosmos when he says, if we gift replicants a past, we can control them better. This seeding of a trauma that stitches the self into a story that the personality oscillates around and labors under to ensure a fidelity of immersion is a fascinating way to consider the function of the wound. So too, we are the poetic Sorry. So, too, we see the poetic humanity of a gnosis as expressed in the romantic pathos of the core antagonist, replicant Roy Batty, in his final elegy when he says, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe, attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I've watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tannhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. In the advent of death, individuality can lead us to the egocentric abjection of experience as a total loss. But cinema itself nods to the witness, who is changed by the experience of being briefly an avatar in an opera of others. In this sense, we could argue, we could argue that cinema itself is a dramatic, gnostic microcosm of a mythopoeic, macrocosmic astrology. Cinema offers us opportunities via our propensity to bilocate our consciousness through empathy, to recreationally embody an experience of stories beyond our own. This latent capacity speaks viscerally to the metaphysical reality of incarnation. Reality may well be dreams within dreams ad infinitum, all the way back to that fateful moment where God briefly awakened before tumbling into a billion-eyed dreaming, differentiated and enfleshed. A year later, in 1985, Angel's Egg animated the confluence of Gnostic and Abrahamic existentialism as revelation and apocalypse co-mingle in heartening and haunting vistas, another fave. Um, the poetic existentialism 
of Japan's animatic capacity to embody Gnostic quests towards Gnosis became a larger philosophical project that would latterly be visited in Ghost in the Shell and Neon Genesis Evangelion. Here, uh, again, we get an opportunity to muse on a Gnostic astrology. Is our Earth the embryonic amniosis of a shadow matter in the procreative metamorphosis of, an of angelic insemination? Is light waking up density in aid of their both becoming more? Is being lost the lubricant towards enlightenment? And has the East been forced to drag the West's traumas through animacy into the light that our shadow, sorry, into the light that our shadow may be confronted, initiated, and transformed? By 1998, the contradistinction of a nuclear messiah was painted in the animatic technicolor of Akira, which explored crisis as initiation into the deific powers of accelerated evolution. The bomb, its orb, and the individual were explored through breathtaking animate vistas of, of bulbous smoke, shifting air pressure, rippling waves of bilious vapor, neon torrents of expanding plasma, and binary strobes of atomic cacophony, abstractly echoing the psychic language and operatic metamorphosis of what it is to become the protogenesis of a human teenager, which we all were. In 1994, uh, interview with the vampire dramatized the passionate pathos of an endless mortality. The main protagonist, bereft at the loss of his wife and child, falls prey to the desperate desire to survive the mortal wounding kiss of a vampire before being reborn into the purgatory of a nocturnal eternity, doomed to be a slave to the carnality of desire by imbibing blood in parasitic acts of impossible rapture. Here we do not see the immortality of a soul, iterantly recast in a plethora of new roles, but instead oneself aghast and abhorred as a static witness to the ceaseless nausea of endless change. The vampire, in this sense, is a Gnostic martyr, doomed to be imprisoned in the unquenchable desire to live from the lives of others that are granted the one thing impossible for them to reach, the reprieve of death, rebirth, and return. The burgeoning vampire culture which birthed this film alongside a variety of literary and cinematic iterations had perhaps its most embodied gnosis in the live action role play communities of White Wolf Publishing's Vampire the Masquerade in the early 90s, which saw people fanatically animate alternative avatars that became beyond a second self, often the primacy of their interactions with a world in denial of the decrepitude and darkness of ghost town suburbia and the nightmares alive in the shadows of the American dream. By 1995, as Pluto moved into Sagittarius, the seed planted in Paris by Chris Marker and his film Le Jeté had evolved into the production budget and imagination of Terry Gilliam's raucous mind, reformed and expressed in Twelve Monkeys. Here we see the main character dislocated in time, laboring to retain a sense of self that is entangled in a karmic knot, whose Mobius unfoldment is a co-present witness to and agent of apocalypse. The film gives us ample opportunities to reconsider our own place within the teleology of an emotional emotional historicism as actors of the weird and fated patterns of our lives and their place within larger scales of becoming, deftly evidencing the fated and quantum nature of astrological transits as microcosmic melodies of matter that world macrocosmic meanings. In the same year, Ghost in the Shell was born, an exploration of transhumanism widely lauded as one of anime's finest achievements. Here, the Gnostic impulse to question authority and transcend determinism explodes into the pace of an action movie with the subtle explorative rigor and poetic voice of transhuman existential philosophy. That same year in Hackers, we see a, post, uh, sorry, a pop Gnostic tale of anarchic rebellion against archontic forces. Much of the Hackers' work is based in a world hidden from the layman, occulted to those who are not aware of the subject-specific language and nature of the systems that underpin the technology whose exoteric face they interact with. The story of the Hacker is an intrinsically Gnostic tale to embody a quest to know the structures that bind us and to use this knowledge to escape their control. Again, magic can be seen as an embodied tool for transformation towards gnosis, a knowledge of self that exists beyond the reaches of other attempts to define and entrap us in their own ill narratives, and astrology offers the raw data, its tides and totems, with which we may actuate the magic of truly lucid change. 
In the same year, Neon Genesis Evangelion, a fever dream of titanic mechanized psychoanalysis, branded the iridescent psyche of a new generation of young minds. The series sees three young characters merge through calculated symbiosis with gi giant mechanic avatars to battle the periodic intrusion of mutant angels whose interventions threaten to hasten an unclear apocalypse. This invasion of star beings from both the cold clarity of space and the ruby magma of the chthonic hearken to the elemental principalities of ancient entities still alive in the theater of Abrahamic cosmogenesis, itself expressed in the series many explicit and verbatim references to the Kabbalistic metaphysics of Judaic cosmogenies. The main character again faces his own wounds on a world stage amongst the toxic militancy of nuclear warfare in which the indeterminate stakes are as high as the extinguishing of all life and or the evolution of a planetary world soul's destiny. By 1998, this Abrahamic existentialism was given an airing through the noir grit of Pi, itself an obsessive search for the secret truth maddeningly present inside the extrapolative numbers of Judaic gematria. The main character wrestles to uncover and survive the revelation of a pattern that underpins all things amongst a, dire, amongst a diaristic exegesis of his ongoing experiments. Trapped between the zeal of a group of Jewish Kabbalists and the greed of American stockbrokers on a lone quest to encounter the beatification, new, sorry, my own, this is my own fault. <laughs> um, American stockbrokers on a lone quest to encounter beatification, new, this should say, the, the beatific numer, numericality of the all. I mean, I deserve that, don't I, for the, all the vocabulary. Um, <laughs> As described by Australian author and magician Gordon White, financier Martin Armstrong created a computer program in the 80s called Socrates, into which he poured all of the financial data from the present, reaching back to Mesopotamian antiquity, in hopes that somewhere within the calculative clarity of its data set, it would discern a pattern from which to predict the chaotic complexity of the financial market. Not only did it work, it began to predict geopolitical maneuvers, regime change, plague cycles, and the ongoing theater of war with Cassandric accuracy. Data is data, and financial data may well be the clearest pointillism within which to illustrate and divine the essence of a greater macrocosmic metamorphosis. Cassandra was cursed to see the future and be disbelieved. This may well illustrate the immune function of a dreaming who needs its sleepers to be changed with the primacy and immediacy of its transformative theater. Sometimes seeing what is coming only serves to amplify the pain of its change. Sometimes wandering into a wound is the only thing that heals us from our harm. Maybe there is a great meaning maturing in all unheeded warnings. By 1999, at the dawn of the millennium, the Wachowski Simpling's cult classic film The Matrix bombastically worlded the materialist summation of a Gnostic pessimism, and with it another opportunity for our world to be implored to face the archontic structures under which it labors that are ghost-written into animate being by a neglecting of the shadow. Drawing heavily on French philosopher Baudrillard's book Simulation and Simulacra, The Matrix is also variously inspired by a kind of dystopian Buddhist futuro Gnosticism, itself seeded and expressed vividly in the implications of Mamoru Oishi's anime Ghost in the Shell and Glaswegian writer Grant Morrison's cult graphic novel The Invisibles. The Matrix dramatizes the existential crisis of the Gnostic conundrum. Are we trapped within um, a controlled simulation we cannot perceive, or as one of the main characters, Morpheus, puts it, you're a slave, Neo, like everyone else, you are born into bondage, into a prison that you cannot taste or see or touch, a prison for your mind. Is this sense, in this sense, the matrix, of, matrix offers the inverse perspective to Westworld, one, a simulated world in which we are trapped by machines, and the other, a simulated world in which we trap them. All astrologers likely hit the hard question of fatalistic determinism when faced by the startling congruity of encoded karma evident in transit calendars, which, like a sheet music for reality, offer tangible notation of the key themes that we as individuals will encounter each month through our interaction with an ecosystem of others who faithfully turn up to play their parts, good or bad, for the enrichment of all. Perhaps the most vital and telling opportunity we have at our disposal to muse on the proposition of a Gnostic astrology is within the prescient capacity of these transits and the larger pattern of individual and collective evolution to which they so dynamically attest. I do believe we have free will, but that freedom at its freest is an expression of exactly who we were born to be, as the determined evolutionary agents of an awkward perfection oscillating ecstatically in eternity. 
Um, I've only got four minutes left, so I've, I've, I thought this was an hour, but there's loads more stuff, so I'm going to skip through a few things. If anyone wants this essay, just I'll give you, uh, give me your email, I'll send it to you. Okay. <laughs> Um, thank you. So, um, so I'm going to skip through these, some of these, but they're good. Um, oh, I'll just I can sum them up. No, I won't. I'll just get through them. Um, okay. Uh, in True Detective Season 1, Detective Russ Cole charismatically embodies the philosophical lamentations of a Gnostic pessimism. Um, whilst questing to end a series of ritual murders, fleshed out in the clipped poetry of the adult character's pragmatic prose, notably when needled during a dialogue with his partner who proposes some hope for humanity, Rust responds by saying, this is like some of the most poetic negativity I've ever heard, um, people out here, they don't even know the outside world exists. They might as well be living on the moon. It's all one ghetto, a giant gutter in outer space. I think human consciousness is a tragic misstep in evolution. We became too self-aware. Nature created an aspect of nature separate from itself. We are creatures that should not exist by natural law. We are things that labor under the illusion of having a self, an accretion of sensory experience and feeling, programmed with the total assurance that we are each somebody, when in fact everybody is nobody. Maybe the honorable, honorable thing for our species to do is to deny our programming, stop reproducing, walk hand in hand into extinction, one last midnight, brothers and sisters opting out of a raw deal. Many of the Sethians, an early branch of the Gnostics, took vows of celibacy as they saw the creation of life as a sin, because to create a body was to entrap a soul in a, wor a world of perverse suffering enacted by an evil entity who wished us dead. They also ritually wished to be freed from the clutches of the Seven and the Twelve, being the planets and stars of antiquity. Rust's monologue continues... <clears throat> Rust mon Rust's monologues outline and lament a Cartesian divide between mind and body, expressing the division itself as the problem, echoing the creation through separation of a demiurge, an egoic mind or god that then seeks to dominate the body or nature from which it originated through an anomaly, a thing that was not expected nor should uh, have happened. There's more, but I'm just I'm going to skip th through. But yeah, if, if you want this, I'll just send it to you. Um, Oh, it's a crying shame. It's funny, it took me an hour to read this out but I don't, previously, but I don't know how I've got through all of this. Okay, uh, we are just going to zip to the end. Um, and so we reach our current moment in which the world has just been exposed to the most thorough and explicit exposition of the inaugural natal theatre of the nuclear wound's birth, um, as has yet been writ large on the silver screen stage. It is hard to overstate the potential of this film to begin a process of reckoning that may quell the hungry hearts of all those whose desire for exponential technological advancements may race us into the indelible reality of looming apocalypse. Even if our organic bodies are extinguished in some shadowed swan song, we may yet return, built into bodies and minds not weaved from the Eden of our star turbine, but from the mechanized calculus of our shadow, which we return... Uh, whether we retain our humanity or transcend it, for better or for worse, is anyone's guess. I, for one, consent to what has happened is happening and will, whilst doing my tiny part to bear witness and hopefully be what I was born to be. There is, however, a non-denominational Gnostic optimism still aflame in me, one that feels contemplative about the macro possibilities of all our micro suffering, in that we may be, in blistering technicolor truth, a brilliant and bitter medicine that through an Edenic dance towards hell on earth, we were an irreplaceable generator of enormous meaning, whose star sailing or sunsetting progeny, progeny will be richer for having briefly been us in the amniotic matter of our mother earth. In summation, in my opinion, a Gnostic astrology would be one that reconsiders the machinations of a living cosmos and works within and through itself to take the various catalytic calamities we encounter in the stories of our lives as evolutionary opportunities to transcend the traumatic reflection of a theatre of change. Each learning from the piece of the layer, larger problem we inherit by way of our wound and do more to be a recuperative agent of unity than a chaotic divisionary machination of an archontic dislocation. 
Hopefully, I have speculatively fleshed out an interesting evolutionary arc within the larger structure of a living cosmos. It has been my aim to try and destabilize the ease of any binary assumptions by recognizing that dualism itself facilitates discussion within difference. I have tried to propose that wounds are initiatory astrological functions of an exponential enlightenment and that people, planets, and suns all carry and facilitate the possibility of transcendence through a transformative imminence towards a unified collectivity. We may well be the microbiotic plant medicine of macrocosmic gods. If we survive our trajectory towards nuclear war and are drunk on materiality coitus with technology that unprotected is bound to birth a terminator, running on the black blood of unremembered megafauna and microflora, we may well travel beyond this moment with the beauty of what we learned by being us, as benevolent pan-galactic ambassadors to inspire other worlds still in their own teenage wasteland on the edge of atomic war, towards worlds ready to learn what more there is beyond it in the incon inconsolably fascinating conundrum that is a cosmos. Thank you for your time and every circumstance, light and dark, that sung you to this spot. Thank you.